Good evening, everyone. My name is Charles Roberts. I'm a product specialist here at Oculus. I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight on our clinical webcast, Managing Cross-Linking Patients from Diagnosis to Post-Op. Before we get started, I'd like to point out that you have a text box on your GoToWebinar screen where you can enter questions. Feel free to type in your questions during or immediately after the presentation, and we'll have some time to discuss them at the end of tonight's webcast. Our speaker tonight is Dr. William Trattler. Dr. Trattler is a refractive corneal and cataract surgeon at the Center for Excellence in Eye Care, located in Miami, Florida. He's a national leader in corneal crosslinking, which he has performed since 2008 as part of the Avidro FDA approval study. Dr. Trattler received his bachelor's degree with honors from Dartmouth University and his doctor of medicine from the University of Miami, where he graduated with a distinction in research. He completed his ophthalmology residency at the University of Pennsylvania and then spent an additional year for subspecialty training in cornea and refractive surgery at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. It's an honor to have Dr. Trattler with us on tonight's webcast, and on behalf of Oculus, I'd like to express our gratitude for his time and efforts. I'd also like to thank everybody in attendance for their time tonight as well. So without further delay, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. William Trattler. Yeah. Hi, everyone. This is Bill Trattler, and I'd love to talk to you all, and I'm excited to talk about this topic, which is one of my favorites. Uh, it's called Managing cross Patients from Diagnosis to to post-op, and uh, there'll be a chance for me to answer all your questions. It's a really important area and topic, and I'm uh, looking forward to having a really fun discussion um, overall. Um, I work with a lot of companies, so these are my disclosures. I am a speaker and I have a financial interest for Avidro, as well as a financial interest in CXLO, and of course I'm a consultant and speaker for um, Oculus, They're the most relevant ones here. Um, obviously, I thought we'd just talk about the basics, which is that, you know, we're, Prior to refractive surgery, we're really working hard to identify patients that are good candidates for laser vision correction. Um, and really, topography and tomography are really critical in evaluating patients. Uh, we use it to see who's a good candidate and identify patients that may have early keratoconus. Um, as well, some, sometimes use it for dry eye, because uh, it also, topography and tomography sometimes can help us identify patients that have a poor tear film. Now, we also use it prior to cataract surgery. Um, and I, you know, I have a Centicam and another topographer as well. Uh, again, we use it for managing and, um, patients and seeing who's eligible for torque eye wells and presbyopic eye, eye wells, identify dry eye, irregular astigmatism, including conditions like EBMD and Salzman, and of course, diagnosing keratoconus, which I'm sure many of you have done. So it's pretty interesting when, I, when my patients come in for cataract surgery and not seeing well, and then every once in a while you get a patient that doesn't realize they have keratoconus, but on your mapping you realize that they do have keratoconus, and the reason they're not seeing well is not just because of cataracts, but also because of the, the condition of keratoconus. I should also jump back to LASIK in that it's surprising how many patients come in for LASIK consultations, thinking that they're a great candidate for LASIK, and it's only on the topography uh, or tomography that they're identified as having keratoconus. Uh, they, these patients had no idea they had it, but it's during these screening tests that we're identifying these patients. So we think about, um, going more towards keratoconus and, and I guess we could call it ectasia after LASIK or other procedures, it's important to point out that ectasia can occur after any um, refractive surgery of the cornea, including LASIK, PRK, SMILE, RK, and AK, and any corneal surgery. But it's also, as you know, most of our patients that have ectasia, which includes keratoconus, have this condition without any previous corneal surgery. Uh, and my experience has been about 85% of the patients that come in for cross-linking have um, no history of corneal surgery, and about 15% have some type of surgery on the cornea. Now, we also want to use um, you know, our topography to identify patients that are cancer for AKs or LRIs or in cataract surgery. Uh, we're going to talk about the V pattern in patients that have had LASIK and, or PRK or SMILE. It's an early sign of ectasia. Um, and we're talking about difference maps, which I use on every patient that uh, either has come in to see me at least once before to figure out how things are going with the corneas over time. So I just want to share one case, and this is not a Pentacam case, but I just want to share this one. This is a patient um, that saw this very nice doctor in Buenos Aires, Argentina, 21 years old at the time of uh, this consultation, where the right eye vision was 2080, the left eye vision was 2025, and the patient wanted to see better because the right eye was blurry. So this is back, this is back many years ago, um, and the surgeon decided to do uh, relax the incisions on the right cornea only to reduce the astigmatism. So you can make AKs 
um, and release the astigmatism. And it actually, the procedure worked great. The patient ended up with excellent vision. Um, he was 20-20 um, and documented stable for five years afterwards um, uh, as well. So, and he had history of being stable, I'm sorry, as well before this procedure was performed. You can see both maps of this patient's cornea look very healthy. He had the AKs to reduce the astigmatism and no surgery in the left eye. So the patient comes back and these are two images of the right eye. Um, again, these are not pentacam images, but just topography images. And it's now 19 years later, the patient's now 40, and the patient's now developed ectasia in the right eye. We describe this as a pellucid pattern. Uh, two different maps both show that this patient's developed in the eye that had those incisions in the cornea has developed a pellucid pattern ectasia. So everyone would think that the likely cause of this is the incisions that are made in the cornea. That must have weakened the cornea and led to this condition. But of course, you need to look at the left eye, which never had any procedures. And these are just little maps showing where the incisions were made. Again, this is just the right eye, two images of the right eye. Um, again, that had the relaxing incisions. Now here's the left eye, no uh, previous surgery, but this patient has keratoconus. So without any surgery in the left eye, this patient developed keratoconus. So my point is, is that, and we're talking about keratoconus after LASIK, is that we don't know for certain if LASIK, PRK, or other procedures, procedures are actually causing the keratoconus, or they would have developed it anyway. Okay, so let's just talk about some patients. So here's a patient of mine that I saw back in 2008, and that's one of the beauties of having a device for many years is you get to look at them over time. So the patient um, underwent chiropractic surgery with a temporal incision in 2011, so a few years after this initial Pentacam map. The patient had it elsewhere. Um, you can see that the patient, although this looks relatively symmetrical, it's a horizontal asymmetric astigmatism, it's, it's orthogonal, it's not skewed, so the axis is straight across. But the K-max is pretty steep, 52.2, so this patient had like a central horizontal keratoconus-like picture. Um, the patient had previous hyperopic LASIK, so maybe that's why the image is a little interesting. Uh, but the patient underwent cataract surgery elsewhere and came back to see me um, in 2018, and now you can see that that irregularity in the steepness has, has actually been exacerbated. And you can see uh, we're using the same scale, and there's more red, and so obviously this is, has worsened over time. The K-max has gone to 57.1, so quite much steeper. And where the difference map helps, I'm going to talk a lot about difference maps, you can see here, what we see is that the central part of the cornea got steeper. The peripheral part around the cone got flatter. And that's what we're going to see a lot of as you look at how things change over time in keratoconus. And it'll be the reverse after cross-linking. Uh, but you can see this patient got significantly worse, and this patient did undergo um, cross-linking to stabilize the cornea. So what is it, the reason we're um, looking at changes in coronal shape is for a variety of reasons. We're looking at it for patients that have keratoconus or pellucid, um, and we're looking um, you know, to see whether it's progressed um, over time. And also, in our patients that have um, had previous LASIK, we're looking to, to identify it and then also see if it changes over time. And then often we can see improvement in coronal shape following cross-linking, and, we, and cro it's critical to look at these different maps to know if patients are stable or even improving or whether they may still be progressing a little bit more and need a second cross-linking procedure. So it's important to, to point out as we're talking about cross-linking that our young kids are the ones we really need to identify early because they're very high at very high risk for progressing. I'm just going to share a quick study. Uh, this is a, looking at the progression of keratoconus um, in crossing patients who are younger by Hadizi back in 2012. Um, and they found that 52 59 eyes progress over one year by a K-max of one after more. So it's a very high percentage, which means that not 100% of kids will progress, but most will, so we want, when we identify these patients, we try to typically get them scheduled for cross-linking sooner rather than later. Now here's an example of an error I made, and I do, did, did apologize that I, that was probably um, not understanding how quickly um, conditions can progress. This is a patient age 10, and the mom, you know, after I identified the pa patient had keratoconus in January 2014, the mom wanted to have the procedure done in April during the, this 10-year-old spring break. I thought three months should be fine. I mean how fast will it really progress, but when the patient came back three months later, this is non-contact lens wear, you can see that the patient had progressed significantly. It went from 58.7 to 63, sorry. And then you can see here, this is the difference map, um, where the blue area and purple areas where it got flatter, and the red parts where it got steeper. So it's not just that the K-max 
deepened by from 58.7 to 63.0, so that's a 4.3 doctor increase. And the cornea got a little thinner by 15 microns. But what really happened was the, the, the flat part of the cornea flattened further, so the asymmetry from the top to the bottom worsened significantly. So it's not just how much steeper, but it's the combination of the steepness below and the flattening above that really made this patient, unfortunately, feel a little bit worse uh, over the three months. Then the patient had, had cross-linking back in 2014 and had steady improvement in flattening and reshaping occurring, but, you know, unfortunately, that short three-month time frame led to some significant progression. And here's another patient, 14-year-old female. So her other eye was 20-20 uncorrected. I diagnosed her with keratoconus uh, in the right eye, actually, she was referred in. Uh, but she saw great in the other eye, and she said, you know, I'm doing okay. And, um, and it's 14-year-old, and the family said, okay, she's doing great. We'll hold off a tiny bit and see what happens. The patient, unfortunately, didn't return to see me for 18 months, and you could see what happened. So you could see how significantly this cornea progressed from 53 to 63.6. And you can see that whole area steepened, and the, the top arc got flatter. And again, the difference map helps us see that uh, it's not just the 10.5 doctors of Kmax steepening, but we also see the flatter area above, so it's even more asymmetric than just you think of it looking at Kmax. Now, how about a 19-year-old? I mean, they're kind of the upper edge of kids, uh, but here's a patient in 2017, already pretty steep at 65.2. Um, and here the patient comes back, and the K-max is 65.3. Now, if you look at these two maps, you'll, you'll see that the, the maps look a little different. Their, their, their red area has significantly increased a little bit more superiorly, so it's not as um, asymmetric. In the 2017 image, which is the middle image, you can see that there's a big, like almost like a bowling ball, thicker below, smaller above. And now it's pretty, a little more symmetrical. And if we look at the KM, that means average K, it went from 53 to 56.2, so the whole cornea has gotten steeper. Uh, but K-Max doesn't change much. And this is what happened, which is kind of interesting. This, uh, he's a non-contact lens wearer, but we hit the whole cornea kind of steepened throughout, although this, the steepest part didn't actually steepen, uh, which is why it looks like it, it didn't really change much. Uh, but it was a pretty interesting uh, change over time. So, so K-Max isn't something that we should always use. We have to look at everything in the cornea. Here's another patient, um, age 23. And you can see that um, in this from 12, 2017 to March 2019, so about 15 months, um, the pretty significant global steepening of the cornea by 8.5 doctors, but central steepening uh, over this time frame. So you have to watch these patients. I try to always recommend patients come in quicker, but sometimes, you know, for various reasons, they do they take a little bit longer to return for a follow-up when they don't schedule right away. Um, here's a patient uh, from back in 2015, a 48-year-old female, a little bit older, um, you can see this is how the patient returned um, two, two years and 10 months later and much steeper in the came and the difference map helps us see what happened to this. Uh, so it's not just the 3.5, four doctors of K-Max, but the whole cornea is steepened in certain areas um, and a lot of asymmetry. Uh, so here's another patient, older um, patient presents with a 3 plus cataract. Uh, we talked about doing cataract surgery first and observing um, non-contact lens wear. Uh, he wasn't aware that he had cataract lens when he came to see me in 2011. And the question is, how much will he progress? Well, I did a cataract surgery. Everything went very smoothly. Um, the patient did well, but then shortly thereafter kind of disappeared for a bit and came back in 2016. And now the, the K-Max had worsened. Uh, when I looked at the pattern, you know, I saw it was a little steeper below, a little steeper above too. So I knew that sometimes you can get a little bit of steepening just for various reasons, a little dryness, other things. So I told me I had to watch him closely, come back soon, and we would just determine if there was progression. So this is a change from 2016, actually came back uh, a little bit under two years later, and now the K-Max went from 56 to 57.1. There's a difference map just from 2016 to 2018, I'm seeing more steepening, um, and at this point we recommended cross-linking for this patient. Uh, and so, uh, again, older patients, this is a patient now 77, 78, who underwent cross-linking. Now let's talk about um, post-LASIK ectasia. Uh, so here, the, the normal, map we want to see is that after myopic LASIK is this blue flat area centrally and a red ring around the edge. Um, and that's the typical map. And here's just two examples of central flattening. Um, and this is a patient I presented to my wife, um, who's an ophthalmologist also, Jennifer Lowe. And this patient came in for cataract surgery. And on the mapping, you can see that the, there's this red splotch right in the middle of what should be this blue flattening after myopic LASIK, which the patient had 20 years earlier. And this is actually a 
early ectasia. That steepening area is actually a sign of ectasia um, or keratoconus developing in a patient with previous myopic LASIK. Um, so thankfully, she identified it and um, counseled the patient prior to cataract surgery. Uh, and um, I'm not sure if the patient had cross-linking at this point, but uh, she did identify the patient, this, the patient discussed it with them. Now here's a patient who had myopic LASIK in, two, in 1999 who came in in February of 2019, so 20 years later, with this funny little pattern where you see a darker blue area, I'll use my, my little um, pointer below, 37.6 on one side, 41.4 on the other, so some asymmetry. And the question is, is whether this is early keratoconus. Because um, the visual axis, you can see where the pupil is, is right where the da dashed line is. So the good news is I had earlier pentagams to compare. So a steep area and a flat area, and is this asymmetry keratoconus developing? What's happening? So the different maps really help us. So here's our 2008 nice flat central round um, my, uh, area, I guess, consistent with previous myopic LASIK in 2008. Now it's this asymmetry, and the different map shows us this central steeping that's been developing um, over the, from 2008 to 2019, over 11 years, with a 4.7 doctor increase. So clearly this patient uh, would benefit from some cross-linking because this patient likely has progressive uh, keratoconus or ectasia after previous myopic LASIK. So I did mention earlier about something called the V pattern, and I'm going to kind of point this out in some of these cases here. This is a patient that had previous myopic LASIK. You see that some of an oval, uh, ablation zone where the blue area is uh, relatively the flat area and it's a little bit of a notch below in 2013. Now the other eye of this patient had actual keratoconus, so I knew to watch this patient very closely. And that's a little V that we're talking about or a triangle coming forward. And is that anything to worry about? Maybe, maybe not. And But I knew the other eye had keratoconus, so let's watch this eye and look what happens over the years. So I saw this patient every year because the patient had crossing in the first eye. And then 2018 the patient uh, continue to develop a little bit more. You can see now it's gained just a little bit more. The V-pattern is getting a little steeper. And the difference map shows us is the whole zone steeping below, flattening above, and the patient did undergo um, cross-linking at this juncture. So, again, you kind of want to watch these patients on, you know, either every four months, six months, or a year, depending on the patient and the severity uh, for progression. Here's another patient. You can see this V-pattern um, right there where you have a triangle steepening below. The zone of flattening above this patient with previous myopic LASIK, LASIK 15 years earlier. The other eye has more obvious ectasia. And then as it gets more advanced, you can see you lose the, the outer zone above of flat of steepening. So the typical myopic LASIK pattern is blue flat centrally and kind of a ring of green or red. And this right eye you can see is green, but we lose that as the bottom part starts to steepen up um, and the top part starts to flatten. Um, so lose that steep order. So these are kind of the, and here's your example. Again, these are just patterns to look out for in, for patients that are that are previous LASIK. I'm trying to show the V pattern or, of early sign of post LASIK atasia. Um, and this is this, the cell eye that patient that had the cro had ectasia in the right eye in 2013 and we did cross linking back then. Okay, and here's the right eye of that patient that I showed you earlier back in 2013 has cared to, had cross-linking in the K-Max got a little bit better, 47.4, so flattened by, uh, from 49.8 to 47.4. Um, and then you can see the difference now because it really helps to see what happened. The steep part got flatter, but the flat part got steeper. So the blue area in the far right is our difference map showing flattening inferiorly where the steepest part of the cornea is. And that being that's nice and helpful, but it's also the, the steeper, the, superior part getting flatter, oh, sorry, getting steeper. The superior part got, is yellow, that's all the steeper area. So it's reshaping following the crossing procedure. That's why this patient's vision is getting better over these years. Now, here's my, one of my cases that I love showing, which is the before and after. So you can see this eye looks a little asymmetric. And then, uh, but, you know, not terrible, but a little asymmetric. And then, four, uh, then this is four and a half years difference, and you can see the, on the right image, same eye. This is obviously keratoconus. The K-max was 45.5, now 50.1. Uh, but I actually kind of reverse things. Uh, that was before, the before and after after cross-linking. So in reality, this is age 33. The patient looked like that map. It looks a little bit more symmetrical at age 38. 
or the KMAX flattening, the difference map shows us exactly what happens here. It's not just the the flat part getting flat, the steep part getting flatter, the red area getting flatter, but it's the combination of flattening inferiorly in this patient and steepening superiorly that we see this much more symmetrical shape in this patient's cornea. The patient has better quality vision, less ghosting. Um, it's really helpful when this happens. Here's another example. And while it's four years between scans, and you can see somewhat normal to obviously keratoconus, I actually reversed it again, because in reality, this is the pre-op cross-linking, and this is a completely different patient. This is the patient four years later, and you can see the K-max got flatter, but it's, again, this major reshaping that's occurring. So it's not just flattening with cross-linking, we see a reshaping that occurs that often leads to improvement in vision. So I really am a big fan of difference maps. Um, the Oculus Pentacam, it really makes it very easy to run. So you always put the, um, the middle or the most, the very first image or that you took in the very, that you want to use as your baseline in the middle, then on the left side is the most recent and then to the far right will be your difference map in these maps. But again, what you're looking for after cross-linking or with keratoconus is that if it's gets flatter in one area and steep in the other, that, that's usually that's improved. On the other hand, when it's steeper below and flatter above, that's likely a sign of progression, either it, whether it had cross-linking or not. So just watch out for those things. So one of the things that's really interesting about keratoconus and cross-linking is that once you cross-link patients, we can see what happens over time to the, to the coronal shape. And so I really like the difference maps. And I decided to pull out for this patient the difference maps because I saw them multiple times after cross-linking. So you can see in 2014, we did this cross-linking procedure. Um, and then in 2015, uh, the patient comes back and their K-max is 2.8 doctors flatter. And this is the difference map. You see this nice central in this patient flattening. And then you look back in 2016. So another year later, now they flatten by 3.5. They come back in 2017. 5.3 flatter, and then they come back again here in, uh, oh my gosh, it's a little bit off my page, so I apologize, I can't see it, uh, 2019 in April, and you know, the K-Max is flattened further to six doctors. So you see this progressive change uh, over time. I really like the difference maps to help us see what's happening um, over time. And you can put them together. So um, you can also, I just did the same page, I kind of mapped it out, showing what happens over time. Um, with the treatment. So I thought, you know, we're, talk we're talking about um, cross-linking and keratoconus. I figured let's just talk briefly about who's a good candidate for cross-linking. So clearly we talked about young patients. And young patients, um, once they're diagnosed, um, I think the general thought is that they should be cross-linked in the relatively near future, usually between, um, you know, anywhere from in the next week to the next six weeks. Um, again, it's, there's so many variabilities to that. It might be three months. Um, it depends on the severity of the keratoconus. So a more you know, monitors the severe keratoconus would probably want to even hurry faster because they're more likely to progress, but um, obviously it's up to the practitioner. Uh, but older patients shouldn't be left out. So just because the patient's in their 40s, 50s, and 60s does not mean they're out of the woods. I've seen many patients um, have progression in that age group. More importantly, I've also seen, um, actually the cross-linking patients get significantly better over time as well. So you have a patient that's in their 60s, and they have keratoconus, and they have lost the best corrective vision from their irregular shape, um, some of these patients can benefit from cross-linking prior to cataract surgery. They have less irregularity, and they'll get a better result with their cataract surgery in the future. So just a thought. And we're, we're going to talk about epithelial on cross-linking, um, with, especially with the VJOS uh, FDA clinical trial um, completed, uh, at least enrollment completed. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, but that'll make it even easier to treat older patients and with less risk. Uh, let's talk about thin cornea. So I get a lot of worries from other physicians and from patients that their cornea is going to be too thin for cross-linking. So I was part of the FDA clinical trial in 2008, the multi-center clinical trial, and actually our criteria was 300 microns was the minimum corneal thickness at the time. So if patients were 302 or 304 at the, at preoperatively, they're still eligible for the procedure. We just had to make sure after we removed the epithelium that we used the hypotonic riboflavin to thicken the cornea up to 400 microns or more. And actually, in every patient I treated that was thinner than 400 microns, after removing the epithelium, I got every single patient above 400 microns with the hypotonic riboflavin. 
And so patients that have more advanced keratoconus with thin corneas or they've had previous LASIK and they're therefore extra thin, uh, I wouldn't say they're not candidates for, for this procedure. If you can take a patient that's 260 or 270 and apply drops and get them thicker to 400 um, after removing the epithelium, um, you can often, they can be quite excellent candidates for cross-linking. Otherwise, they're going to keep progressing and you're going to have to have a transplant. So um, you know, just to share that thought. Um, and then just, you know, many of the FDA clinical trials now, I know on clinicaltrials.gov, they're using 375 as the minimum uh, corneal thickness at the start of the UV light treatment. Um, so 375 at the start. And just to point out that uh, many of the, you don't continue to measure the thickness throughout the 30 minutes of light treatment, if you're in 30 minutes, for example. So once you get to 375, you treat, and they may actually end up a little thinner at the end, 350 or 325, but patients have done very well with this pro when, you know, in these situations. So again, thickness sometimes I feel maybe a little bit overblown, but again, more, more work on that. I think Steve Corneas can benefit. Um, corneal opacity, the even if it's in visual axis, um, often or not, that is not as visually significant as people think. With a scale contact lens, people can obtain excellent vision. So um, just sharing that, we have some excellent scale contact lens fitters in South Florida. Um, just fantastic. I feel so lucky with these rock stars and who just love scale lenses uh, locally in my area. Uh, and then also, you know, working with, with doctors in Fort Lauderdale, Delray Beach, West Palm Beach, Naples, and other areas that we're really lucky. Um, but these patients really benefit. Um, and then also patients with previous coronal surgery, such as um, ring segments, previous LASIK smaller, PRK, and coronal, even coronal transplants um, can benefit. I actually performed a uh, crossing patient, a crossing procedure today on a patient that had a previous, had high drops in one eye. She underwent, she developed a small perforation, had a coronal transplant in 2015, and she had, and she had her transplant in 2015, and then we've been following her, and she's developing significantly more astigmatism and some irregularity over the last three years since we had all the sutures out. So we did do a, you know, a, a cross-linking procedure on this patient today, um, and thankfully, you know, this should help stabilize this, her uh, cornea from further progression. Um, just to point out that young patients can, can definitely benefit, and we've been doing very well with our young patients uh, using uh, just verbal anesthesia. And so, I saw this really nice article by Dan Reinstein, a step-by-step -step guide to verbal anesthesia, um, which he has um, online at, at the London Vision Clinic. Uh, but it's just, um, you have a family in the room with a patient, um, just be patient over time. And we've done very, very well treating patients who are very young, um, as young as seven, um, having the procedure done, we're just with the family members um, in the room and, and just taking our time. So we've not had to, go to the uh, operating room and use serious anesthesia. Now, what is the purpose of cross linking? Let's, we'll jump to uh, the procedure itself. Um, I think we all agree that it's to stop the progression of keratoconus. Uh, but interestingly enough, um, you know, it's more than just that. What we see, and I think I showed you um, in some of the maps earlier, that we expect to see some improvement in coronal shape and, pr and improvement often in the uncorrected and best corrected vision. It's not a guarantee, but many patients can get improvement over time, especially as you watch them at three, four, five, and six years or longer after the procedure. Um, I do want to share with you some details on uh, the Vidro and the progress they're making on Epithelion. Um, I have worked with Epithelion with the CXLO technology since 2010, but I've been really excited for Vidro. They uh, finished uh, enrollment for the phase three registration study uh, for Epithelion cross-linking. Uh, this will really make uh, the procedure, um, help the procedure in many ways um, with improve safety, and it should be just as efficacious. Um, I think what's interesting about the clinical trial is that they also are using supplemental oxygen. Uh, they are using a shorter UV protocol, but it's really supplemental oxygen that may be playing a, a really helpful role also. And I'll show the, the details that Avijo is kind enough to share. So they developed this new mask to deliver increased oxygen during the cross linking procedure. Um, and we have an example in the right of a map that shows the um, Shomox Stroma oxygen concentration before, during, and after um, cross-linking. And with, um, with the epi-off, which is this red line, Dresden and room air, you can see that when the light turns on, much of the oxygen is consumed, and there's very minimal low levels of oxygen in the cornea during this um, procedure uh, with just a typical, you know, system we're using. So um, what they did is they decided to look at 
a different pattern, which is let's use a supplement with oxygen. And then when they turn it on, because there's oxygen going in, um, even after the light's using a lot of oxygen in the initial uh, few minutes, or, um, you can see that it maintains a nice baseline of oxygen available for the crossing the procedure. Um, and so I think that's going to be really helpful um, down the road because we may see a, a more intense uh, cross-linking um, results with this using the supplements of oxygen with this mass that was developed by Avidro. Um, this is just another maps looking at bio, biomechanical impact. Um, they did some some studies, and these are in pig corneas, so these are not humans, but they did the uh, Epion 30 milliwatts room air. Then you can see that with the oxygen, it's, you get uh, increased elastic modulus, so it means that the corneas were stiffer, and then they compared to Epi off in room air, and again, this is in pig corneas, but again, the Epion with the oxygen makes, makes a nice difference comparing the way the uh, Avidra does the Epion with and without oxygen. So, we're pretty excited to see the results, and hopefully that becomes available to all surgeons across the country in the very near future. Um, just to point out, once we start with Epion, one of the key steps is riboflavin loading. So I've been doing the Epion for a long time, and I, I took some pictures of some patients that didn't have adequate ribo loading. So um, while the current Epi-off um, instructions say you look for flare in the anterior chamber of the eye, uh, that should be forgotten. It doesn't matter how much flares in the AC. It all matters about the corneal cornea and the, and the saturation of riboflavin in the cornea. In this example of this patient, and this is one of my earlier cases where um, I don't think we were using a sponge at that time um, to potentially put the drops, put, keep the, the riboflavin central. You see that there's this area that was not completely treated with riboflavin. Uh, when riboflavin is in the cornea, the, force, the blue light from the foot lamp makes the cornea fluoresce, but you can see there's a whole big area that's not fluorescing. And on cross-section, you can see that there's not enough riboflavin present, so you want to continue to load this patient. Don't take them across linking the UV light because they'll get an inadequate treatment. Here's some examples of some eyes that had Epion that had excellent riboflavin loading, and you can see one patient had intacts, the other one did not, but these patients both had excellent loading. And at the bottom, since we're treating centrally, we use a sponge, and it's the central part that got loaded, the bottom part did not, you can see the difference. Um, there's this little call to action also that in our patients that are more advanced in keratoconus, besides crossing them, let's remember that scar lenses can often provide excellent vision. So these are three examples from Dr. Ed Boschnik, uh, who's just down the block from me, who shared with me these patients that had a history of high drops, had central scarring, but they're actually seeing quite well with scar lenses. Um, the scar lens really makes a big difference for these patients. So again, you might want to consider crossing these patients with advanced keratoconus despite the scars because if they could get good vision with scar lenses, they can avoid a corneal transplant. Here's some other pictures of, uh, from Dr. Boschnik of these really advanced patients with keratoconus. So this patient, 66-year-old um, male with a severe keratoconus, we call it the global keratoconus, and the patient seeing about 2050, 2060 with, with a scar lens. And, you know, for some patients, it may not be good enough that they may need to see better. Uh, but for some patients, if this is their fellow eye and the other eye sees great, and they may be happy enough that they're seeing well with this very advanced keratoconus, because um, obviously there's risk of transplant. So um, just throwing that out as a concept. And uh, here's um, a, the image of a, of a severe keratoconus patient. Uh, they're very old, they're a much older, 81-year-old patient. Um, and you can see this patient saw 2050. Now here's a patient of mine uh, who had treatment many years, a couple years ago. So the K-max is 81.3. Thinner cornea, best corrective vision could be is 20-80, no opacity. Um, and you can see, even though they're very steep, 81.3, uh, from 2014 to 2019, we saw significant improvement in the corneal shape, as well as significant flattening of the K-max. So you can see 12.4 doctors flatter, steeper above, and this patient got significant improvements um, over these, um, uh, over the four years and three months between, uh, from the treatment uh, to the latest follow-up. Um, so these steep corneas can do quite well with, with cross-linking. Um, here's a patient with a pellucid pattern who actually got a little bit worse in some respects, maybe. So cross-linking with um, um, this is a pre-op uh, before Epion in uh, 2010, and this is the image in 2015. So 45 months later, and the K-max went up from 46.9 to 47.7. And look at the difference map, and there is that area below that got steeper, uh, but there's a central flattening just below the center and a little steeping above. And so if you really zone in, you can actually see that this patient's um, 
right in the very center of the visual axis, it's got um, steeper above, flatter below. So actually, that's why the patient's best corrective vision went from 2040 in 2010 to 2020 in 2015. So just because the KMAX went up by 0.9 doesn't mean that the patient actually um, is getting worse. Um, might this patient need cross-linking in the future for that area that might be going higher? We'll have to watch them carefully and see. Uh, so far, the patient's been pretty stable, so we've done okay. Uh, here's a patient that KMAX also increased by 0.9. Um, they have stable best character visual acuity, um, but you can see that they're, they're, um, so they're getting a little bit worse. The vision's been relatively stable over these years, but you can see the difference map is concerning. So for me, this patient, I, re I recommend a retreatment because the area of steepening got more steep, the area above got flatter. So I felt that this patient would benefit from a repeat cross-linking procedure since it looked like the patient was just mildly progressing over this time. Again, 0.9 KMAX increase by itself doesn't mean the patient's progressing, as we just showed, but this one is this one is suspicious with a difference map getting worse, so I thought that crossing is the right thing to do. Uh, the, ri the risk for needing second treatment is variable, but various papers have said that the rate is between 2 to 3% to 7%. This is from Dr. Uh, Seiler's and Michael Morgan's uh, paper, about 7.6% need for repeat, for progression with repeat treatment needed. Um, there's a paper that found about 3% need for a retreatment. So we just need to watch our patients. So just because they're crossing doesn't mean they're out of the woods. It's an important point. And when you think about why they didn't get, why after initial treatment with crossing they may need a second treatment, uh, it could be that we didn't load the riboflavin properly, so there wasn't enough riboflavin present. The UV light may not have been centered on the weakest part of the cornea. We may have continued eye rubbing, which is a very common reason that I've seen in my practice when the, the occasional patients need a second treatment, they admit to eye rubbing. Um, elevated eye pressure has been shown as a rare risk factor, but could be a risk factor. And more commonly, you can also see pseudoprogression. This is where the patients wear contact lens pre-op, um, so the, the pre-op scans are inaccurate, so we don't really know. Or they wore the contact lens too close to the most recent visit, so those scans are inaccurate, or dry eyes. So all lots of things to watch out for. Um, so again, as I mentioned, I'm a big fan of looking at the difference maps. Um, and so when I look at my outcomes across thinking, what I'm looking at is, I'm comparing the change over time with these difference maps. Uh, I'm looking at the K-Max a little bit as well, but it's really the difference maps that give me the bigger picture. I look at vision, uncorrected and best corrected vision, and also refractive error. Um, you know, are they developing more astigmatism or less astigmatism? Uh, if their best corrected vision acuity is dropping, I need to know why. Is it the cornea? Is it the cataract? Is it the cataract developing? Is it something in the macula? It could be so many different things. Uh, we need to watch for, for also for uh, glaucoma in these patients as well. So this year, I think this is my last case, but uh, this is a patient that had cross-linking in 2011, uh, 27 years old at the time of the procedure. And you can see in 2016, there's some significant flattening, and you see the difference map, how that improved over time. Again, just like I showed in the other cases, the nice reshaping that's occurred. So it's not just the flattening, but the reshaping that made a difference. And now we look at from year five to six, KMAX got even further flatter from 49.2 to 47.9. You can see that now we have green above, and these numbers are a little bit higher. Like, for example, in 2016, this number here was 40.8, now it's 41.5, so it's this reshaping that's really making this patient's vision improve over time. Um, so in summary, and I'm happy to answer questions, um, I think we need to identify keratoconus early. We want to treat early once we identify it, remind the patient not to rub their eyes, and of course, watch for recurrence. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Trettler, and for all of you in attendance, thank you for being here. Um, we've got some questions, but just to remind you, on your GoToWebinar screen, you have a text box for answering those questions, so if you enter them now, I'll be able to read them off for Dr. Trettler. If you did miss part of the webinar, webinar you will be receiving a link for the recording tomorrow. Uh, if you have any questions about tonight's webinar, the Pentacam, you're welcome to contact us at 888-284-884. Uh, 8004. Let me put that screen up here. Or you can uh, send us an email at sales at oculus, oculususa.com. So we also have prior webinars like the one available tonight uh, available on our website at oculususa.com. So I'll just go ahead and get into the questions. Um, our first question is, how much change in curvature and or pachymetry is needed for you to determine that the progression is real? 
<clears throat> so that's a great question. So the, the question is how much change do we need to see? So the first thing is that there can be variability in measurements uh, in the patient. If they have dry eyes, they're not looking straight during the, the when we take the image. They may be wearing contact lenses the last day or so or even the day of the exam. So when I do see a patient that looks suspicious, they may be getting worse. The first thing I do is I talk to the patient that, that things look a little bit like it's going in the wrong direction, and I bring them back a few weeks later for one more set of readings because I really want to verify that there truly is a change in the wrong direction. Um, it's not common, but it can happen. And so I don't find that the pachymetry is as helpful because it's very, you know, if the patient has dry either, sometimes the epithelium could be a little bit extra thin, for example, so it may not always tell us the answer. Um, what I'm looking for is those difference map changes. So the K-max could be 0.5 worse, but they may have progression. It could be one and a half to two doctors worse, but no progression based on some difference map, the vision, all these different things. So every case is unique, um, and I really find that repeat measurements are what really helps us understand what's happening in the cornea because, again, anyone measuring there could be some variability for various reasons. Okay. Um, our next question is, do you do cross-linking uh, combined with partial PTK or PRK to smooth the surface? Great. So combining, so using PTK for epithelial remo removal has been discussed um, and uh, and has there's been multiple papers talking about this. Uh, for epi office, a very effective technique uh, because the PTK mode basically not only removes the epithelium, but removes a tiny bit of stroma just to the very steepest part of the cornea in some patients. So um, a number of uh, clinicians have reported excellent flattening at when combining PTK with cross-linking and felt that the results were even better than just removing epithelium manually. So that can be done and it has good good outcomes. I've not done that personally, but I know that, that uh, my colleagues have done it have been very happy with that technique. Um, combining PRK or topo guided PRK with cross-linking has mixed results. Um, John Canalopoulos, David Lin, Simon Holland, and many other experts around the world have shared their wonderful results of combining PRK in a limited fashion with the crossing procedure. However, um, the one thing that is a challenge is that there is a high risk of haze that can develop. And so often, like, you know, you'll use um, serum tears and every last management you can to make sure the epithelium closes as quickly as possible. But there is a much higher risk of haze in combining procedures from what I understand. Um, I have limited experience. My experience was unfortunately not the best because I did experience some haze that developed. So I kind of pushed me away from that combined technique. Um, so I don't do the combined technique anymore. So I think it can be done. There's definitely some people that swear by it. They say it's really wonderful. It makes a difference. Um, there may be some technique -ish, um, things as far as how some people are getting some better results than others uh, and avoiding haze. I have colleagues that tell me that they got haze and they'll never do it again, and I have other people that say they'd like to do it. Um, so I think it's still up in the air. And my, what I typically do, though, is I do sequential. I do cross-linking first, let them improve over time, like I showed you in today's webinar. If the shape improves, it's much easier to reshape the eye with laser vision correction because it's less irregular. If you're doing topo-guided, it's less, less for the topo-guided technology to reshape. Um, and so I find sequential. I'll do cross-linking first, wait anywhere from six months to five years. And the more time you wait, the more reshaping you get. And then you do the PRK in the future. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, yeah. Our next question is, I was under the impression that keratoconus doesn't often progress much after the age of 40 uh, because the cornea undergoes natural cross-linking by that age. Is that not the case? Or do you really only see this as ectasia? Right. So, that concept that the cornea strengthens itself is inaccurate. If you do testing of patients who are 50, 60, 70, 80, and measure their, their strength of their cornea, their strength of the cornea, if they have keratoconus, is exceptionally weak, much weaker than a normal person's cornea, even a, a child's cornea. Um, the cornea, does, it might get perhaps slightly stiffer than it was, but not strong enough to um, be considered strong. So those corneas, in, who, patients with keratoconus who are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, they're at risk for progression. Uh, again, I've definitely seen people stable over 15 years, 
Those are typically people that have more mild disease. So you can see somebody who has mild keratoconus or mild pellucid pattern, you know, and you kind of, and they see pretty well, um, you know, and you follow them over time. I've seen some of those patients stay stable for 10 years. When I look at my patients that have more moderate to severe keratoconus, those corneas are exceptionally weak, and over time they keep getting more, they can continue to progress. I think the, the hard part is a lot of times they aren't being followed, um, but I've definitely seen multiple, multiple patients um, so I don't ever feel confident that just because someone's over the age of 40 that they're going to be stable. I actually feel the exact opposite. I feel that these are these are these can be high risk patients. We want to identify them and make sure they don't get worse. Um, and you may be surprised if you actually follow your patients um, carefully that you'll identify more patients than you think that it can progress. Okay, uh, thank you. Actually, that there, we have another question. Uh, what are your follow-up guidelines for, or what are your frequency guidelines for follow-up, and uh, how does age and severity factor into your guidelines? Oh, those are great questions. So the first thing I have to do is, is you know, we do the procedure, and whether you're doing epithelial off or epithelial on, you want to make sure that we get the epithelium completely normalized. So the epithelial on it may be one to two days. With epithelial off, it could be, you know, four to five days to seven days, all depends on, on various the technique for epithelial removal. And once you get beyond that, um, then it's gonna be it's gonna all depend on you know the patient's characteristics. So with epi on, um, my experience has been that uh, once the episode is back to normal by one to two days, they're pretty they they do pretty well post operatively. So my next visit with them is often in the six month range. So they'll come back and see me in about six months. Um, obviously if there's um, other issues going on, dry eye, or other things that will be seen in between for those other conditions. But, you know, looking at the, the comparison map before and after, usually it's about four to six months before you can see a change. Even when it's going to get worse or get better, it doesn't happen immediately because it's already been strengthened by the procedure. With epi off, as we remember, the epithelium gets thick, steeper. When it grows back, the epithelium grows back at the normal thickness, which is typically steeper than it was pre-op, so patients often look steeper at the one-month visit. And by three months, they get back to normal. And then by six months, you can see the nice improvement. That's just the average, and there's all these variabilities. So with epi off, you might see the patient a little bit more frequently to get a sense of which way they're going. But then typically, once they're in a good state, you might see them every six months or longer if, they're, if they've done well with a procedure um, and avoided haze and other issues. Um, and then you, it's, I agree, it depends on the severity. So if someone who's more severe, um, you may want to, you might need more measurements to see the you know, the variability. So you might see them every four to six months. Uh, someone who's mild, you know, you might feel more comfortable seeing them eight months, nine months, or a year later if everything's looking good. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, our next question is: Are posterior float difference maps more accurate than surface changes? That's a great question, and so uh, the Pentacam. Well, I mean, we start off with the orb scan, so before the Pentacam was available, and the posterior float was thought to be something that was helpful. But then there's some data that suggests that wasn't as helpful as we once thought. And there's a posterior, kind of a posterior float type of map um, on, you know, on a typical Pentacam map. Um, and I don't tend to use it very much, because what I typically will use instead, um, I'll use with a couple other parameters, which I guess I didn't really get into, which is called the percentage thickness in increase, the PTI. Um, and the concept of the PTI is that, on the Pentacam, is that um, if a patient has some thinning centrally because the cornea is uh, kind of stretching centrally, the peripheral cornea thickness doesn't really change much. So it's the percentage thickness uh, from the center to the, to the periphery of the cornea is thinner centrally and the same peripherally in keratoconus versus somebody else. So you can actually see differences in these maps, um, in, these, in these curves, and it helps you pick up early keratoconus. Um, so I probably didn't put that one in. And I'm a really big fan of the bad display. Um, the bad display is a balloon ambrosio display, and, and has some really good data on that. It helps us look at uh, various parameters that could be helpful to identify some uh, early changes looking at um, various curvatures in the front and back of the cornea. Um, so at the end of the day, there's, all, there's going to be a variety of different patients, and there's no one perfect display that's perfect for all patients, because in some situations, the sagittal view can look normal, but the posterior can look abnormal. But I have cases where the front part of the cornea looks abnormal, but the back looks relatively normal still. So 
there's not every patient is going to follow everything exactly. So in some situations, you just have to follow them over time. If you're not quite sure, um, you may be suspicious, and then you can have them come back in three months and see what's changing. But that's a great question um, about posterior versus anterior. But in my experience, I worry more about, I think the anterior part of the, of the maps really gives us so much information, um, and that's what I trust the most to, to understand what's happening with the cornea. Okay. Um, our next question is, in what time frame do you expect the cornea to stabilize? And once it's stabilized or stabilization is achieved, would you consider them a candidate for refractive surgery? Perfect. So I think once you perform the procedure, you strengthen the cornea. Um, we don't know if you've strengthened the cornea enough to completely stabilize the cornea. Um, so that's where you're going to follow patients over time. And, but you know that with whether you're doing epi off or epi on, the cornea is stronger after than it was before. So we know it's stronger. Um, and then when you see them back at you know four to six months, typically you get a sense of which of how they're doing. Is there a little bit of improvement? If you start seeing the difference maps where there's some reshaping, where it's getting flatter in the C part and steeper in the flat part, the typical pattern you expect to see, you, you feel pretty good. You're moving in the right direction. And so I typically tell my patients that uh, for, with, if you have mild keratoconus, you know, kind of borderline keratoconus, and we're crossing you first, and we're going to do laser vision correction in the future, you know, we could do it probably as early as six months if they're in the milder stage and, and they're, they're correctable to 2025 or 2020, um, and we really made them stronger, then we can do it earlier. If you have patients that are more advanced, um, you can certainly, um, once you identify that they're stable, perform a topo-guided PRK to try to further improve their shape. But the only caveat to point out is that the more time you give it, the more improvement in coronal shape they get from cross key only. Um, it just makes the topo guided procedure just that much easier. Because there's less asymmetry, the cornea is more normalized. So there are some benefits to waiting. And I've waited for some of my patients four or five years where um, you know, the, the shape of the cornea is actually much more symmetrical. And um, I made the procedure, you know, instead of doing topo guided, I was able to do wafer guided and get some very nice results um, overall. So, um, I do think that, you know, being patient is key and, and letting the patient know they have a serious condition. But if we're patient and let it improve over time, we'll get to a good point where they can be offered the laser vision correction to further improve their, their cornea. Uh, I guess the other caveat is you obviously don't want to thin the cornea too much. So and that's a judgment call. If you're if they're like a minus 10 myope, myope with astigmatism and um, and they have keratoconus and even they've been crossing, that might be, if you're removing 150 microns of, tissue, that may be too much. Um, so you do want to be cautious in how much tissue you remove. Um, don't forget there's procedures like the ICL that can correct high, high levels of myopia and astigmatism if needed. So that's another option instead of laser vision correction. Uh, so I hope that's a good overview on, on that situation. Definitely. Thank you. Um, we have time, I guess, for uh, uh, maybe one or two more questions. So. How long do you keep your patients out of your lenses before performing cross-linking? You know, hybrids versus RGPs versus scleral lenses? That's a great question. So the reason we keep them out of the lenses is not because it changes the results of the procedure in any way, but you want to get a good baseline. And the biggest challenge is that when patients, if patients come to see you two or three months prior to their actual cross-linking procedure, and they for some reason wait two or three months, that previous Pentacam map may not be accurate. They may have progressed. So they may have happened the coronal shape. So, um, you, so I always like to use the day of crossing the treatment as my baseline. So for scar lenses, the, they recommend three days because surprisingly enough, it can actually impact the coronal shape. So three days off is optimal. Uh, for hybrid lenses and RGP lenses, it's usually two to three weeks or a little bit longer. I mean, usually by two weeks, you can get a relatively close idea of what the shape is like, but obviously, you know, the longer you wait with RGP lenses, it's even better, but it's just tough. Patients often can't wait that long. So typically, if I, they can wait two weeks, it's, it's optimal um, to at least get that far out, but, um, you know, it's always a hard um, discussion because if patients are reliant on contact lenses to live and function and work, they can only stay out of the contact lenses for so long. I am a huge fan of scar lenses. I really love that technology. Um, it keeps the, the, the kind of lens away from the cornea and only on the sclera, so it really protects the cornea and you don't get any pressure on the cornea. So I do try to uh, recommend that many of my keratoconus patients switch 
high level RGP lenses and even hybrids to scleral lenses. Um, obviously, not every patient is a candidate, but um, that's been my positive experience with scleral lenses. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we really only have time for about one more question. So we do have a few questions about uh, progression in kerat keratoconus. So uh, this one is, in children, once diagnosed with keratoconus, do you wait until the progression to deform, perform cross-linking or do you immediately perform a diagnosis like, like in Europe? Right. So, well, so this is a quick answer. As soon as you diagnose someone with, with a kid with keratoconus, 8, 9, 10, 15, 16, 17, please, right away they should have cross-linking. In the next couple weeks, next month or two, obviously if it's very mild and it's just a borderline case, that can be followed and they're correctable in 2020. But if they've already lost best corrective visual acuity and they have obvious keratoconus, the sooner they can get treatment, the better. They're going to progress. And there's no reason to wait because um, the sooner you can cross-link them, the, the sooner they'll start to improve rather than get worse. We get one more question? Yeah, it was... Yeah, we had a similar similar one, I guess, uh, same same idea, just with adults, as far as treat, when do you treat with progression? or. Yeah, I mean, adults are a little bit more difficult because you don't know how quickly they're going to progress. So I typically tell them, you know, we'll try to do the next um, couple of months, you know, if they want to wait two or three months, they can. Um, we, we often don't know, and I, I've seen patients progress a lot in just a short period of time. So um, I always let patients know that it's obviously their eyes, their decision, they have to take time off from work. So sometimes it's, it's not convenient for them. So, uh, but sooner is usually better better than you know waiting for a long period of time. Um, I thought, you know, older patients, you know, you might ha think you have some time, but you can sometimes be surprised in a negative way. And um, again, the sooner you, you once you start the treatment, you're only going to get better from that point typically. So that's why sooner is better. Okay. Um, do we have time for one more or? Yeah, maybe one more. I'm ready. If we got one more. Okay. Uh, we just uh, our last one is: What is your preferred drop regimen after cross-linking to prevent haze? Would that be? Uh, that's off? a great question. Yeah, so that's a great question. So with epi off, you know, there's definitely a, a risk of haze, and um, we can use topical steroids to try to minimize that risk. Uh, but let's also not um, forget that also um, dry eye and other inflammatory conditions of the cornea can also increase your risk for haze. So we want to be really work hard to first get the epithelium healed. Um, so that's the first thing. So the quicker the epithelium heals, um, the better. Um, some doctors may add other things if there's any type of delay, such as an amniotic membrane or serum tears or something like that, if there's any signs of delay. Um, and then once they're healed, again, you really want to optimize the ocular surface, treat their dry eye, treat their black aritis, um, and use topical steroids. So, so for some people, you know, the standard regimen may be for a couple weeks. But other people, if, the haze, if there's still some mild haze that's affecting the vision, you might have to use a steroid for longer. Um, I did have a patient that I did epi off on that I had to um, use drops on for about four to five months because they got some significant haze. Eventually, they did, did well, but um, they were on for a long period of time. So every patient is going to be different. Um, and we want to be careful also that these patients can get a younger patients are at high risk for a elevation eye pressure, so we've got to be very careful and monitor the pressure of the eye closely when they're using uh, steroids, especially strong steroids. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Troutler. Um, that's all the questions we have, and thank you, everybody, for sticking around, and uh, I'd like to also thank all of you, those, those of you who sent in the questions. Uh, again, thanks, Dr. Troutler. Thank you for your excellent presentation and for your added discussion here at the end. This concludes tonight's presentation. So again, thank you everybody for attending and, and thank you Dr. Trattler. And on behalf of Oculus, I, I wish you all a good night. Thank you everyone. Hello?